Thank you, Basti and Brendan, that's beautiful. I invite you to open your Bibles or your phones or tablets to John, the 18th chapter, verse 38. John chapter 18, verse 38, it reads, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. You know, in Sabbath school this morning, we had a little discussion on the, the lack of certain supplies, and it reminds me of a story um, about four years ago. I had taken a group of my RAs. For those of you who don't know, I'm the boys' dean here at Thunderbird. And um, some of the leaders in the dorm, uh, our residence assistants, we usually do a little camping retreat before school starts each year. And uh, we took the boys up, and we went up to Flagstaff, and we went out into the pines and set up our tents. And, um, Next thing you know, nature calls, and one of the boys comes to me and asks, Dean Mark, um, where's the toilet paper? Yeah, Chuck, this one's for you. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I looked at him and I said, well, I, I didn't bring any toilet paper. And uh, he said, well, what, what do I do? And I said, well, there, there's this specific plant that, that's called lamb's ear. And I said, it's, it's better than toilet paper. And um, Long story short, when there is a lack, sometimes you have to get a little creative, but sometimes the alternatives can be even better than it was that you were looking for in the first place. So if you don't, if you don't know what lamb's ear is, it's a nice, soft, pliable plant, and uh, actually does work pretty good. So we do a lot of camping there. Um, on a more serious note, uh, I would like to pose the question that I think all of us have asked at one point in our lives. And that is the same question that Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? I'd like to go back to, to John chapter 18, and uh, let's look here. Are these both on? Uh, let's look there, and let's start in, um, let's see here, where do we want to start here? Uh, John 18, let's start at verse 28. We're going to kind of read the whole narrative to get a little more context uh, John 18, verse 28. Here we are. Jesus is in Pilate's court. Um, he had been arrested. He had been kind of taken back and forth between the leaders, and, and now he sits in Pilate's court, and he's brought before him. Then they, laid, uh, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early in the morning. But wait, when they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover... Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. 
What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when Pilate had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. What is truth? It would have been a pretty cool thing to have sat there and allowed time to unfold and Jesus were to answer this question in great detail, but the circumstances and the time didn't allow for that. But we do have the answer. That answer is found in the scriptures. And George is coming to fix it. Testing, testing, loud and clear? All right, there we go. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? All right, so the question again, what is truth? Uh, we've all asked that. I know I've asked that uh, many a time. And I'd like to go, um, and I'd actually like to share some things that uh, I, I like to listen to uh, two of my favorite apologists, um, Ravi Zacharias, heard of him? Yeah, Indian gentleman. He, he speaks across the, uh, the world. He's a, he's a Christian, a Bible believer, does an amazing job defending our faith. And one of his partners, Abdu Murray, who is a little bit younger, he actually was a Muslim converted to Christianity. And uh, I just came across one of his books on a little radio show, and I looked it up and kind of been spending a little time doing some, some research and some reading and some listening about this, and um, came up with some really cool things to add into the sermon. But that question, what is truth? You guys have probably all heard or, or seen a little poster or a bumper sticker that said something along the line of, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I think that is where Pilate stood at that moment when he faced Jesus. Okay, he stood for some things, but he didn't stand for the thing. He didn't stand for God, the eternal one. And when put face to face with Jesus, okay, God incarnate, you know, Jesus' son, the word, the word became flesh. He's standing there right before the truth, and he asks, what is truth? He found no fault in him, obviously, but he was more concerned about the people's opinion of him and keeping peace than he was in actually hearing an answer to that. And I believe maybe that's part of the reason why Jesus didn't answer him more specifically. He gives us what we want. He gives us what we need. He'll give us what we're willing to receive. But let's, let's think about the world we live in today. Are we any better off than Pontius Pilate was at that moment that he was face to face with Jesus? You guys have probably heard the term postmodernism. Have you heard that term before? You know, philosophers use it and all this kind of stuff. Basically, long story short, uh, postmodernism is what most people would consider the overarching worldview of most people today in the, the modern society. Uh, Postmodernism is uh, basically the mindset that whatever is true for you is true for you, but whatever is true for me is true for me, right? If you've heard that, you've, we've experienced that in our lives, right? We've seen it in politics, we've seen it in education, we've seen it probably in Walmart or on an airplane. Whatever is true for you, it's true for you. Whatever is true for me is true for me. Because we're so worried about offending people. We're so worried about maybe if someone doesn't agree with me that we're just going to kind of pussyfoot around the absolutes and we're just going to kind of accept everyone and everything's going to be fuzzy, pink, and everything's all good, right? Well, that's not really how it works. As Christians, 
I think we need to step out of this mindset. You know, this postmodern mindset of the world today has really kind of neutered society of the ability to think and speak about important things without that fear of criticism, right? We see it on social media all the time, right? People can say every, everything they want because they're behind a screen, but you get people face to face and all of a sudden things change. We're not willing to have that discussion out of fear of criticism or conflict. What about us as Christians? Can we or should we think for ourselves? Well, I sure hope the answer is yes. You know, be, and one of the things I constantly try to enforce in my students, no matter what class I'm teaching, one of the first things, and I, I repeat it often throughout the year, is that being where we are in history, this age of, of information with the internet and, and all these things, at the tap of a finger, we can have just about any question under the sun answered with various different, from different angles, different perspectives. One of the most important things for us to realize is that we have to become intelligent consumers of information. Amen? We have got to have a discerning filter as we expose ourselves to the many things we come across, these many, this, this myriad of different answers that will get to one simple question, which one is actually true? Okay? So we have to be intelligent consumers of information. That's one of the, the, the huge foundations of, of finding truth. Second question I want to ask is, can we and should we freely defend what we believe? If we do find something that we want to adhere to and follow, should we as Christians be willing to speak about it openly and defend it? Or should we be silent out of fear of offending someone else? Politically correct, if you know what I mean, right? We're sometimes so worried about being politically correct that we just kind of seal our lips. I don't think that's what Jesus is asking us to do. So the topic today is truth. What is truth and why is it so important? Well, first of all, let's, I want to take a quiz. How many people like zebras? They're pretty cool animals, right? You know, they have pretty stripes and whatnot. Well, I, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little true and false quiz here, and hopefully this little quiz will help us understand some of the different um, presentations of uh, truth, okay? Because there are a lot of different things that people believe. Well, truth is this or truth is that. Um, we're going to try to debunk some of these myths. So the first true and false question I have for you, and it won't be graded, so don't worry about that. Um, we'll just do it by raise of hand, okay? Everybody cool with that? All right, so true or false? The zebra, native to Scandinavia, is known for its black and white striped pattern. Is that true or false? How many people say it's true? How many people say it's false? Okay, why is it false? They're not from Scandinavia, for crying out loud. When you mix truth with error, it is always going to be false. Am I doing that the right way? False, right? It's always going to be false. Isn't that what the devil did in the beginning? Took a little truth, took a little error, mixed it together, and he caused confusion or Babylon, and here the whole world is living in the result of that sin, right? Truth and error always equal error, all right? So that's one important thing we need to keep in mind. Second question for you, okay? Uh, the zebra is, has black fur with white stripes. Is that true or false? How many people say that's true? How many people say it's false? Okay, before I tell you the answer, I'm going to ask you another question. The zebra has white fur with black stripes. How many people think that's true? How many people think it's false? I pretty much ask you the same question, right? Okay, so... Here's the point in that. That would be what we would now call subjective truth, right? That George might be adamant and, and hold on with all his might to the fact that zebras have, zebras are white with black stripes, right? Okay. Nehemiah over here, he's thinking, no, nah, zebras are definitely black with white stripes. What are you talking about, George? You don't, you don't know anything. And they could butt heads all day long. And neither one would compromise because each one of them thinks they have, you know, it's subjective. Their, their truth is based off of their presupposition, 
their, their upbringing, whatever mindset that led them to that supposed truth, that it is subjective, okay? Now, let me ask you another question. Zebras have black skin and black and white fur in striped pattern. Is that true? Is that false? And this means, I don't know. Okay, and most of us are like, what are you talking about? I don't know. Okay, I, of course I did the research on this, so I do know the answer. Um, I was trying to be an intelligent consumer of information, so um, you might want to double check my work here. But the point of the matter is that uh, that would be con considered objective truth because yes, believe it or not, zebras actually do have black skin. Okay? Now their fur, that may be a little bit more subjective, so I worded that in a way that they have black and white fur in a striped pattern, right? That is true. We can scientifically prove that by shaving a zebra and seeing, oh yes, it does have black skin. And we can look at the fur and say, well, whether it's black with white stripes or white with black stripes, that's debatable, but we do know it's black and white and it has stripes. That's objective truth. We can prove that. Now the question, the, the reason I'm sharing these different things is because, well, for one thing, there's a term called relativism. Okay, and we're not going to spend the whole time talking about all these. This is kind of leading us into some substance here. But I wanna, uh, we have to have a little bit of a background because it's, it's good to see how confused people are about truth. Relativism basically means there is no absolute truth. Huh? There is no absolute truth. I mean, come on. But that, that is the mindset there. Um, truth is always relative to some other factor like culture, religion, language, some other variable and it can change over time, and that kind of leads us in back into that postmodern mindset, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. Now, that may seem all great on the surface, but when we have two people that adamantly believe in their version of truth, and they go head to head, it's ultimately going to be decided on which one is bigger, stronger, and more dominant. And that creates an unhealthy, an unhealthy situation, right? And someone who could be in great error may have their version of the truth and come in and dominate, and just because they're stronger, bigger, smarter, faster, more dominant, they're going to win the, the, the battle, the war, or whatever. And that, that is not what we as Christians are asked to do, okay? So the danger with this relativism in, is that someone might even say murder, rape, child abuse, that these things are not absolutely wrong depending on the culture or the situation, okay? You can see where we're getting into some dangerous ground, right? A person could claim the right to abuse some of these different actions based of, off of their perceived situation, and we've seen that in different cultures, right? We've seen, well, we, you know, one group says it's not okay to smoke this drug. Another group says, well, we can smoke this drug because it is part of our religious ceremony. Another group might say, well, it is, it is okay for you to have relations with um, women other than your wife. And other groups say, and it is only okay to have relations in a monogamous, committed relationship within that marriage covenant. Okay, and we, we can see how structures can be broke down and the world can become pretty chaotic fairly quickly when we, had, when we accept this mindset. It's a dangerous thing to be in. Absolute truth. Okay, objective truth. And I, I like the word absolute truth because objective has a strong connotation to it. But when we say absolute truth, it adds an element of punch. You know what I'm saying? And when I'm talking about, the rest of this time, absolute truth, I'm talking about absolute truth, okay? It, is, it, it transcends time, place, culture, language, situation. It is absolutely true in absolutely every situation for absolutely every living being under the sun. And for that matter, in the entire universe. You know, this, this postmodern world your truth is true for you, and my truth is true for me. We ultimately basically create our own truth. But absolute truth, absolute truth is not an acceptable claim for these people. 
So we have got to step out of that mindset. Don't worry about being politically correct. Don't worry about offending people. Now, don't go out of your way to offend people, for crying out loud. Don't, don't miss what I'm trying to say here. But when it comes to defending truth, defend the truth. Christ never backed down when someone opposed a moral principle of, the, of God's law or his character. He never backed down. If he offended them, that was on them because absolute truth doesn't change. We are to change to fit absolute truth. That is God's call for each and every one of us. We are to rise above what we are to become what we should have been in the first place. You know, Abdu Murray is a gentleman that I mentioned earlier. He is one of uh, Ravi Zacharias's um, partners. Uh, when they go around, they speak. And Abdu Murray just wrote a book. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Saving Truth, Finding Clarity and Meaning in a Postmodern World. And in this book, he talks about this new, and actually it's not that new, it's been around for quite a while, but it's becoming more accepted and more widely talked about. Instead of postmodernism, he calls it post, has anybody heard this? Post-truth. Post-truth. Now we've gone into, we've not, we're stepping into, and I think we're actually got both feet in it already, we just don't realize it. Postmodernism, where your truth is true for you, my truth is true for me, and we'll just all live happily ever after, even though we're going to butt heads and fight over it, and the domineering person wins. We won't talk about that part. But we've, we're shifting from that into this thing that Abdu Murray and others before him call post truth. Hmm, what is this, and why is it important? Why in the world would I talk about it? Because I believe this is the overarching worldview that is going to be what most people are going to slip into when Jesus comes. And here's, here's what it is, and here's why. Post-truth suggests that we um, now agree that there is absolute truth. Okay? Let me just read this here. Uh, we are now shifting from postmoderns. Everyone has their own truth to what Abdu Murray calls post truth. He suggests in his book, um, Saving Truth. I, I wouldn't I actually have not read the book yet, but I've I've heard a lot of things about it and I've gleaned little bits and pieces that I have taken. But I'd like to get the book and read it. Uh, Saving Truth, Finding Clarity and Meaning in a Postmodern World. And he says that we no longer hold on to everyone's individual conception of truth, but that now many are admitting that there is absolute truth. So they're saying, okay, okay, okay. This, this, your truth, my truth, doesn't make sense. So yes, there is absolute truth. But we now place more value on our feelings than we do the truth. That's dangerous. We now place more values on what makes us feel good, the road of least resistance, than we do on absolute truth, even though we admit it is there. That is a scary situation to be in. Amen? Okay? If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Isn't that the state of mind that the devil wants us to be in right before Christ comes? You know, I heard, uh, one of the things I was listening to this last week, I'm going to share it with you. Ravi was talking about, I think it was Mussolini or somebody, and a, a woman came in and talked to me and said, you know, how long do you expect these people to continue to follow you when you keep treating them so badly? And he calls for one of his servants. Bring me a chicken. They brought this guy a live chicken. He takes the chicken, grabs it up by the neck, looks at the lady, and he starts defeathering it right in front of her, just aggressively, violently plucking the feathers out of the chicken. As the chicken is squealing and, and writhing in pain, he takes every single last feather off the chicken, plops it down to the ground. The, the, the chicken kind of comes to and, and is running around kind of just in pain and whatnot. And then the guy goes and he gets a piece of bread and he puts the piece of bread down to the chicken. And the chicken walks up to him and starts eating the bread out of his hand. And he looked at the woman and he said, as long as I'm around and I provide what they need, it doesn't matter what I do. They're subject to me. Are we in a state where we're going to allow people, systems, principalities and powers to cause us to bend over backward to that kind of tyranny? 
I would sure hope not. This new way of thinking, uh, let, me, let me back up here a little bit. Um, this paradigm has shifted from your truth is your, is your truth and my truth is my truth to I believe there, I just read that, sorry. Um, so what this does is it complements what we know about end-time Bible prophecies, okay? Um, absolute truth takes the back burner to what we prefer for the perceived betterment of everyone. See where I'm going with this? Absolute truth, even though we know, yeah, this is what the Bible says, but we're going to compromise absolute truth because for the betterment of all mankind, we see this path as the path of least resistance, and we see the masses, and we see the, the, the desire to be politically correct and not to offend and to draw all people unto us because we are the supreme power, that we are going to bend over and allow our, our conscience and this absolute truth to be put on the back burner so we can now move forward for the betterment of mankind. And it's going to look appealing. It's going to look attractive. It's going to be delivered by the most intelligent, well-educated, attractive, articulate people that we've ever seen on the face of the earth. And most people, as the Bible says, will be deceived, right? The very elect, if it were possible, will be deceived. Let's go to back to that question real quick. What is truth? And more importantly, is the Bible true? Let's look at John 17, 17 real quick. John 17, 17, if you want to flip there. It says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And then we go back a couple more chapters to John 14. Let's look at another verse. John 14, uh, verse 6, it says there, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, any skeptic with half a brain would say, well, yeah, you're just reading from the Bible, and the Bible is true for you, but it ain't true for me. Is the Bible truth? I heard one amen. Amen. Okay. Does an amen get us there? No. You ever heard, I, I heard this articulated best, I, in my personal humble opinion, by a, a Baptist gentleman. Of, of, I'm, I'm quoting non-Adventists here because I hope we do agree that the Bible is our source of truth. And if someone from another denomination organizes a, a thoughtful analysis of the Bible and they present, I, I think we have permission to, to use that. And we're, we're, we're claiming that from the Bible, not just because, oh, well, we better not listen to people from different denominations because they don't understand the state of the dead. Well, guess what? Neither did I 20 years ago. But now I'm here preaching to you in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are all seeking for truth. And this is where we find it. So this gentleman, Baptist gentleman by the name of Vadi Bakum, um, I enjoy listening to him as well. He came up with this, and I actually wrote this in my Bible because I like to use it. Um, I like I, I plagiarism, whatever, but hey, I'm giving him credit. But he says this, and we could go into a whole other sermon on why this is true, why this is valid, the historical accuracy of the Bible, um, the cooperation of eyewitnesses and different things like this. But Vadi Bakum says this, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim to be divine rather than human in origin. Can you see why I wrote that down? For one, my brain wasn't smart enough to memorize it. Number two, I think it's great. I think he has... Uh, has, he's taken this in, and he's digested this, he's made it his own, and now he's sharing that with others. And I think that's what God's calling each one of us to do as well. Okay? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, let's, let's, see, let's ask another question. Does truth change? Does truth change? Because I, I know things now that I didn't know back then, and I sure thought they were true back then. 
or do I change around the truth? Okay, God is unchanging, ladies and gentlemen. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? He is the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega, right? The beginning and the end, the beginning and the last. He, he, he transcends time. We cannot put constraints around God, right? I like how Job puts it. You know, were you there when I created the foundations of the world? Were you there when I created the, the Leviathan and the this and the that and the, the stores of water and the, the mountains, which we would call snow, right? Um, were you there when I did all that? It's one of the things that, that science fails to do. Science um, fails to prove that God didn't create the world because in order to be scientifically proven, things have to be observable, measurable, and repeatable. Now, on the flip side of the coin, we can't prove that evolution didn't happen based on that either because we weren't there the supposed 1.4 billion years ago when the big boom happened and all that kind of stuff. We don't have to rely on science because we have historical document that is accurate, right? We believe George Washington existed because we have historical evidence that he did. I've never seen his bones. I've never seen him. I've never talked to him. I, I can't measure him, repeat him, or observe him because he's dead. But I can look at historical documents that were written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and I can say, yes, George Washington did actually exist. And we can have that same truth claim about Jesus Christ based off the fact that he, there were eyewitnesses. And the whole, whole historical thing. I'm getting off on a tangent here. That's a whole other topic altogether. Okay, so the question is, does truth change? Let's look at the Ten Commandments. They were written in, they're written in stone, stone, you know, Christ, the, the cornerstone, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, the stone, the Ten Commandments, a reflection of God's character, the unchangeable nature of God's character is reflected in the fact that he took the time and said, oh, Moses, put the pen down for a second. I'm going to take care of this one because this one doesn't change. Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God in stone, represents an eternal unchanging law that was there before the creation of the earth and that will be there afterwards, right? Every creature of the sun from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another will come and worship God in heaven. Amen? It doesn't change. God doesn't change. He says, I am God, I change not. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So, is the Bible true? Yes, I believe it is, and we have scriptural and historical evidence that it is true. Um, does it change? No. The Bible in and of itself makes it evident that it does not change. Number three, is the Bible really true? Is it really true? I mean, yeah, it was maybe true, but is it really true? Um, some people would tend to look at certain scriptures that tend to be, they see discrepancies and contradictions and be like, aha, look at this. The Bible can't be true because according to, let's, let's look at one example real quick. We'll, we'll close on this example. I know we're going a little over here. What is over? Does church really have, I mean, it's Sabbath, right? Okay. You guys mind if I ramble on here for just a couple more minutes? Okay. My stomach's starting to growl too, so I'll, I'll hurry. Um, let's look at uh, Mark chapter 5. Let's go back in the book of Mark chapter 5. Take me. I want you to look this up because I don't want you to just take my word for this. Uh, Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 20. We're not going to read all that, obviously, for sake of time. But uh, um, let's see here. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start here at verse, uh, chapter 5, let's just sit verse 2. And when he came, he's, he just crossed the, the sea there, the, the Sea of um, Galilee, going into the country of the Gerardians. He says, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the boat, um, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. A man. How many is that? One, a man, right, with an unclean spirit. Now let's go look at Luke real quick. Same story, different, different book. Let's look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Let's see if we can find the specific verse we're looking for here. 
Luke chapter 8. Okay, and when he stepped out of the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time and wore no clothes. So here he's naked. And I wrote down the two that had one. I forgot to write. I don't know which other. Real quick, you guys are going to have to help me out here, okay? Are you willing to do that? I'm asking your brains to switch from neutral <laughs> to at least first gear, okay? Uh, someone tried to find that same story. Is that in... I'm looking for the version that talks about there were two demons, right? There were two de uh, demonic men. Okay, it's in one of the other Gospels. What is it? Matthew 8, 28. Let's, let's check that out real quick. See, this is good. When, when, I, when I fall short, it makes us all kick in here. 528. And when he'd come to the other side of the country of the... You're guessing, I'm not how to say that, uh, there to meet him, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass on that way. So here we have a, a fairly common argument by many skeptics where we look at two of the four Gospels and their rendition of this demon possession that took place when they got to the other side of the sea. They talk about one man who was demon-possessed comes. And then we look at Matthew, and Matthew gives his story and his account of two demon-possessed men coming to meet Jesus. And they say, aha! Bible's not true. Contradicts itself. And I say, aha, the, this to me confirms that the Bible is true. Because if everything lined up perfectly exactly the same, we can see how man have, could have come together and formulated this. And we'll make sure, it, what, what does your say? Okay, I'm going to, you know, that kind of a thing. They can, they can check and do all this kind of stuff. But when we have people independently writing of the same account with slight variations from their personal perspective, we can see that this actually adds validity to the story. And here's why. When I was in Kansas, I told this story before, but I'm going I'm I'm to give you a quick brief version here. I, I came across what I considered men that were demon-possessed. We were passing out socks. Remember the story, those of you who have heard me before? We were passing out socks to homeless people. There were two gentlemen that came. One was much larger, more aggressive, stronger, and uh, posed much more of a threat than the other one. The other one was small, and uh, they came to us, and they didn't like us in their, quote, territory. We were invading. They were thought we were going to call the authorities. They were drunk. They were, they were writhing and literally drooling at the mouth and gnashing of the teeth. And it, it was like one of those old Bible stories when they come. They were, they were literally going to stone us. But the one guy weighed like a buck 25. He could barely stand up straight, and he was carrying a really small rock. I wasn't real concerned about him. The other guy was about my height, built like about Jared, the guy who plays the piano sometimes. You know, the big, strong shoulders and arms. And I looked at him, and I was like, oh, boy. And he was holding a big rock. Big strong guy, big rock, threatening, gnashing the teeth, saying they're going to kill us. If they had a gun, they'd shoot us, and blah, 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 blah. When I tell that story, my whole emphasis is on the big guy with the big rock. You know what I'm saying? Okay, from my perspective, that was the guy to focus on. From my friend's perspective, who was with me during this time, his perspective was that there were two guys, each of them had rocks, and they, they were both coming at us and threatening us. I could care less about the little guy. I could have taken one finger and thumped him in the chest and he would have fallen over. But my friend tells the story and he focuses on both. Do, do you get a little bit better understanding of how when we take certain situations and different people that were both there, how they might have a slightly different variation of the story? Were they both true? Very, were, were, was each variation an accurate rendition of the story? Yeah, they just weren't totally complete, but they complemented each other, right? And there are some other various stories in the Bible that we've, we had time we could take a look at, Mary Magdalene and the, the, the anointing of Jesus' feet, and there's some slight variations in there. The bottom line is, these were literal eyewitnesses that were writing down their account and their version as they were divinely inspired to do so, and with the slight variations, those who really reflect and think about it, it actually adds validity 
And the, corrobor the corroboration of these stories actually is stronger with those slight variations in the fact that we have individuality and we have sincerity in all of the writings. Amen? We're going to have to end here. I, have a, I can ramble on for quite a while, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with that. But uh, one thing I want to remember uh, before we leave here is, number one, there is an absolute truth. And Jesus Christ is the embodiment, the embodiment of that truth. Okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your unchangeable character, your rock-solid truth, and the hope that we have in your soon coming. And I pray that each one of us would be willing and courageous enough to seek you and find you. I pray that each one of us would be willing and brave enough to stand up to defend the truth as the ambassadors that you created us to be in this crazy world, to uphold you, to lift you up as you lift us up and give us the strength to do so. We ask that we'll go about in this confused world right now and do just that. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, the truth. Amen.